Great. So this evening we're going to discuss protein and we'll think about the various sources. And before we begin, I just want to say again that the purpose of this program is education. So please do check in with your doctor, inform them about the lifestyle changes you are making and what your blood sugars are um, looking like and let your doctor adjust your medications, ask them to adjust your medications as you're making these lifestyle changes and as your blood sugars are coming down. It looks like I need to adjust my window a little bit. So Patricia had an unusual story. She was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of 62. And she was diagnosed with an autoimmune form of diabetes, uh, type one and a half diabetes. Now she read different sources on uh, nutrition and she wanted to adopt a diet that would optimize her blood sugars. So she chose a ketogenic diet, which was high in chicken, eggs, fish, and dairy products. It was pretty high in protein and in fat, and it was low in carbohydrates. She was only eating 30 to 40 grams per day. And she was injecting 40 units of insulin per day. So she was using about one unit of insulin for every one gram of carbohydrates. She followed this diet for six months and she started to feel fatigued towards the end of the six months. Also, she noticed that her weight had plateaued and pretty soon she wasn't able to lose another pound. So at that point, she looked on Facebook for some other options, and she came across a higher carbohydrate, lower fat plan. She decided to give it a try. So she turned her diet on its head. She quit eating the meat, the dairy, and eggs, and she introduced a bunch of foods that she had actually been craving. These were whole plant foods, which were high in carbohydrates. Before she made the diet change, her A1C was 7.1. And after four months on this plants only diet, her A1C had dropped to 6.4. And two years onto this program, her A1C was 6.3. She was off also 50 pounds lighter after two years. She was eating 300 grams of carbohydrates every day and she was injecting 21 units of insulin daily. So her carbohydrate to insulin ratio was actually 14. So it had increased from one to 14. So that meant her insulin sensitivity had improved by about 14 fold. And this all happened because she switched from eating a diet that was um, low in carbohydrates and high in animal protein to a diet that was high in fiber rich whole plant foods and low in animal protein. So she didn't completely reverse her diabetes because as you'll recall, she had an autoimmune form of diabetes, um, but she definitely improved her blood sugars and was very happy with the results. So protein is the building block of life. Every cell in our body is made of protein. The basic structure of a protein is a chain of amino acids. These amino acids are strung together and then folded back and forth to form the three-dimensional structure uh, like the one you see here. Amino acids come in two varieties. There are essential amino acids, which can be made by the body. Sorry, there are non-essential amino acids, um, which can be made by the body or can be found from the breakdown of normal protein. And then there are essential amino acids, which the body cannot make and which we need to get from our food. So how much protein does a person need? Well, we often are told 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight, um, but for persons with diabetes, according to the text I was reading, uh, the recommended amount is 0.8 grams per kilogram of desired body weight or of ideal body weight. Now, if you want to convert this to an English-based system, you can calculate uh, 0.36 grams per pound of desired body weight. And in this course, we've been recommending about 10 to 15% of calories from protein. So if you follow that, you'll be getting um, the recommended amount. You will not be short on protein. 
People in the US consume more protein and in particular, more animal-based protein than people in any other country in the world. And you can see this survey from 2015 to 2017 showed that in North America, we were eating 200 pounds of meat um, per person per year. And this was over six times what persons in Africa were consuming. Now, eating all this excess protein does not lead to bigger muscles or better health. Instead, the excess calories from protein are actually stored as fat. While society's heavy emphasis on protein is not warranted, protein is still an important part of a healthy diet. So while we're planning our meals, it's important though to consider the food package. Protein comes in two sources. There's animal protein and there's plant protein. Now animal protein is packaged with a lot of nutrients which we tend to overconsume. We get saturated fat and quite a bit of cholesterol with animal protein. On the other hand, plant protein is packaged with nutrients that most people underconsume, like fiber and antioxidants. Now here's a list of amino acids depicted in various colors at the top of this table. And we see a list of essential amino acids and a list of non-essential amino acids. So the essential amino acids are the amino acids that we'll want to get from our food. And you can see that whether we're looking at animal foods or different types of plant foods from legumes to vegetables, um, Foods contain these different amino acids just in varying amounts. Um, some foods may not have all of the amino acids, um, but there are a lot of amino acids in all of these different foods. So you may have heard that plant-based proteins are incomplete and that they need to be carefully combined in order to achieve an appropriate uh, protein balance. That belief has actually been disproven because the body is able to store amino acids to build the proteins that it needs um, as those proteins are needed. So as long as amino acids are being replenished by eating a variety of plant foods over time, there's no need to be concerned about incomplete proteins. So plant foods are actually an excellent source of protein. Now, how does all the protein that we Americans consume from meat affect our risk of developing type 2 diabetes? Harvard University did a study looking at health professionals. So they did the health professional follow-up study and then the nurses' health study one and the nurses' health study two. And in total, these studies involved over 200,000 persons who were followed for 20 years. And they found that Eating one serving per day of unprocessed red meat increased the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 12%. And in the one serving per day of processed red meat increased the risk of type 2 diabetes 32%. So what constitutes a serving of meat? Well, three ounces of cooked lean meat or poultry would be a serving. And this is about the size of a deck of cards. So that amount of protein would take a small amount of room on the plate. A meta-analysis pooled the results of uh, various studies, and they looked at the impact of consuming 100 grams per day of meat, and they were looking here at three and a half servings. So three and a half servings of meat make 100 grams. And they found that whether this 100 grams came from poultry or from unprocessed red meat or processed red meat, the risk of diabetes type 2 went up as people consumed more meat. So there was a stepwise rise in the risk of type 2 diabetes as people increased their meat intake. Now, what about eggs? Eggs have been controversial. Back in the 1970s, people were concerned about consuming more than one egg a day because they are a concentrated source of cholesterol. However, now eggs are considered a good source of protein. Uh, many people are thinking about the minerals that eggs contain, and so they're considered a nutritious food in many circles, and they're really making a comeback. How do eggs, though, affect the risk of long-term diseases like diabetes or heart disease? I think this is a good question for each of us to ask when we are evaluating 
um, the health effects of eggs. To answer this question, um, Harvard University again did a study looking at over 21,000 male physicians who were followed an average of 20 years, and they rated the frequency of their egg consumption. And they were in five categories, all the way from less than one egg per week to seven or more eggs per week. And the researchers found that egg consumption was associated with an increased risk of death from all causes in a dose-dependent fashion in men with diabetes. So the risk was especially strong in the physicians in the study who had diabetes. And the risk went up progressively as people increased their egg consumption. In fact, the risk of death was doubled in men with diabetes who consumed seven or more eggs per week compared to those who consumed less than one egg per week. So we can see that eat, eating more eggs, especially if we have diabetes, can increase the risk of premature death. But does egg consumption actually increase the risk of developing diabetes? Well, that question was um, asked by a group of researchers who looked at a number of studies. They pooled together the results of 12 studies involving over 200,000 persons. And you can see here on the graph, the risk of developing type two diabetes depicted vertically, and then the frequency of a consumption. So the lowest risk was at right around zero to less than one egg per week, or right around one egg per week. And the risk went up um, as people consumed more eggs. So when you got it to eight eggs per week, the risk of developing type two diabetes was increased uh, around 40%. So why do eggs increase the risk of diabetes? It may seem logical that eating red meat or really any kind of meat would increase the risk because meat has saturated fat, it has um, cholesterol in it as well. But eggs uh, have choline, which is also found in meat, and choline produces inflammation which contributes to the risk of diabetes development, at least it's thought likely to contribute to the risk. So our recommendation in this program is to cut down on eggs and eventually eliminate them from the diet and to instead eat nutrient dense whole plant foods. So we've seen that there are two types of protein. There's animal protein and there's plant protein. Animal protein increases our risk for developing type 2 diabetes, and it also increases the risk of death, um, early death. Thankfully, it is possible to obtain all the essential amino acids from plant protein. And in our next session, we'll discuss why plant proteins are so good for us and how we can get them in our diet. I will stop sharing my screen. All right, thank you. Learning some very interesting things that I have not heard before. Thank you. Uh, now it is time for our spiritual part of our session. Pastor Chris. Yeah, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about a powerful biblical principle that really affects every area of your life, in particular, how it relates to this program. In Genesis uh, chapter 1 and 2, the Bible gives an account of how God created the world, and he placed Adam and Eve in a unique location. I mean, God could have designed any environment for Adam and Eve to have been in, but he placed them in a garden. And the Bible tells us that he placed there every tree for food. Um, they could eat whatever they wanted. If there was a pineapple on the ground, they could eat it. I used to think pineapples grew in trees, but I've since learned they don't. Um, if there was an apple on the tree walking by, they could just pull the apple and eat it. Uh, they, they had whatever they could want to eat. I mean, there was no um, <laughs> deep fat, you know, deep oil uh, fryer there. Um, you know, it was just natural the way God created it. it was the environment he placed them in. But there was something there that he placed that they were not to eat. The Bible tells us that he placed there 
a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he said, do not eat of this tree, for when you do, the day that you eat, you will die. God placed boundaries around what was appropriate to eat and not to eat. Uh, he designed Adam and Eve. He knew it was best for them. And uh, he's, in essence, designed you as well. I mean, you are the, the long, long, long descendants of Adam and Eve. And God knows what's best for you. But God gave Adam and Eve something called choice. And that's kind of what I want to highlight today is, is this choice that God gave Adam and Eve. They could choose what to eat, what not to eat. They could choose to follow him, what how, not to follow him. This choice that God gave to Adam and Eve um, is something that could connect them either with him or reject themselves away from him. Um, when I was in high school, there was, there was a young lady that I was very interested in. Her name was Faith Hubble. And uh, just a beautiful blonde girl, and I really had become good friends with her. Um, we spent a lot of time together, did lots of things together. And, and one day I, I made a choice, a decision, that I was going to ask her to be my girlfriend. And so I sent a message over to the girl's dorm. I said, we were at a, at a boarding academy. I said, could you meet me outside? I want to talk with you about something. So she said, sure. So she came over and I said, well, let's just go for a walk. And so we started walking around what they called faculty circle. It was just a, a road that went around the houses that all the faculty lived on. And so we went around one time and I just could not get up my courage to ask her. I was just so hard, you know? I mean, like, what if she says no, you know? Oh my we went around three times, four times, five times, eight times. Like we, and she's like, nice walking with you, Chris. What's up? <laughs> so I, I asked her, I was like, so would you be willing to be my girlfriend? Um, she's like, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> that decision, the choice I made to simply ask her to be a part of my life has changed my life. I mean, she's now my wife. We have had five children together. We'll be married 27 this 27 years this uh, this October October two. I know our anniversary, um, and the the choice that I made to have a relationship with her totally changed my life for the better. Uh, my life is so much better because she was willing to be a part of my life. Um, it's the same with you and I. We have a choice that God has given us, and that choice is to to be connected to Him. Um, he has all power available to us. And when we simply choose to be, follow him, to, to follow his plan for our life, we have a source of power that we could have no other way. And so I just want to encourage you in this program to choose, to choose to follow God and the plan that he has for you. Uh, last week, we talked about Daniel, um, this book in the Bible, this man that lived, uh, you know, around 600 BC, long time ago, he was a captive taken away from Israel, and he was living in, the, in, in Babylon, uh, and the king brought him there, and he provided everything for him to eat that was, a lot of it was not healthy. I mean, there was wine, and there was meat, and there was unclean foods, and there was all this stuff that was not, that was not designed to make him healthy, and the Bible says in Daniel chapter, uh, chapter two, Daniel chapter one, excuse me, that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's food. He made a decision. He made a choice. And that choice connected him with God, who would give him the strength that he needed. So it's an interesting story. We'll talk about more about that story later. But Daniel's choice directly impacted his life. And his life was so much better through the choice that he made. So I just want to encourage you as you go through this, choose to follow God's plan for your life. Choose him. I mean, you don't have to. We're not, we're not twisting your arm just because we're a church offering this health program doesn't mean that we're forcing you to, to, to believe in God. But, but we want to share with you that, that the choice to allow God to give you help in your life will be one that you'll never regret, that the power and strength that he has for you is amazing, and uh, it will make all the difference in your life. So God bless you as you continue walking through this program. I'll turn the time back to Kendra. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Well, that takes us to what probably should be one of our favorite parts, but if you're like me, <laughs> it's not. It's time for our exercise feature with Laura. Time for us to get up and get our blood pumping. So Laura, we're gonna give it over to you. That's right, it is time for us to stand up and start our exercise for the evening. So 
I'm going to share my screen with you here. All right. So I want to go over some more um, in-depth tips on how to change your burst training this evening. So we are going to go over a few more things beside what we learned over the last couple of weeks. Last week, we talked about increasing the length of each burst. So this week, I want to focus on other ways that you can increase your training potential through burst training. Now, while I'm talking, I invite you to get out of your chair and stand up and walk in place and just do a little activity here. I want to remind us that the goal of burst training is to work on exerting ourselves, okay? We're always looking for ways to make our heart work so that it can gain effectivity in its pumping potential. So as we do this, I want to remind you, just as Dr. Aisha did, that we should choose only, uh, we should choose to speak to our doctor, our physicians about this and make sure that we are doing this program under their supervision. And also remember, please only choose one way to increase your aerobic exercise in any one session probably one way a week actually is sufficient for, for each of us. So we started last week with learning that we could increase the length of our bursts. We also learned that we could increase the number of bursts of, in an exercise session. So this week, if we began with doing three to five bursts, this week we could increase by one burst so that we were doing four or maybe six bursts, depending on where you started in your session. Okay, another way, we could increase the number of days of burst training we're doing in a week. So when we started, we suggested that you start burst training three days a week, okay? This week, if you could not increase the number of bursts in every session, you could add a fourth day of the week that you are working on burst training, okay? Another option, number four, option number four is that you could increase your speed. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, walking my road outside here at home is an easy way for me to get my burst training in. As I'm doing my burst training, it becomes pretty common for me to see landmarks. Maybe it's the neighbor's rose bush or a specific mailbox, something that I am pushing toward. So this week you could see if in your bursts, you can get a little farther than you have in the past during those bursts, okay? On that course that is becoming your regular habit. Number five, you could change the terrain. I have a section of my road that is level, but in Tennessee, as my father will tell you, there's not a whole lot of level ground. <laughs> there are a lot of hills around. So you might wanna add a hill into your burst training course. If you do, make sure that you get a good warm up in first and also make sure that it's not the last thing that you do that you get a good cool down in as well. But putting, tucking that hill into the middle of your course is a good way to increase your burst training potential. Number six, you could change what exercises you're doing. Perhaps there are some of us who walking is feeling easy. Well, you might want to change it to jump roping. Or if you know what burpees or mountain climbers are, you could try those. Those are still um, advanced for me, I feel. Some of us, if we need an easier way to start, Perhaps we could start just by sitting down and standing up and sitting down and standing up and work on our sit to stands. That can be a very good exercise as well. You could also try biking with bursts and see what you get. So your assignment this week, because we have already changed the length of our burst session, is to choose one of numbers two through six. Number two was increasing the number of bursts in an exercise session by one. Number three was increasing the numbers of days of burst training in a week. We could increase our speed based on our typical course that we are working on. We could vary the terrain or we could change what exercise we are doing. 
But I, my assignment to you is to choose one of those six and change that variable this week. <clears throat> Remember our goal, we're trying to get our heart to beat faster. We should be out of breath at the end of each first session, unable to say a complete sentence without a little bit of a pant in there. And as we slow down after our burst training, our breathing should return to normal and our heart rate before we add another burst, okay? As you continue, your heart and lungs will improve in their efficiency. Your breathing will start to normalize more quickly after each burst session, and your heart rate will start to go back to its resting pace faster as well. To get this to happen, you need to stay consistent, okay? So as you stay consistent, you're gonna find that when you go to the doctor's office and they are checking your heart rate, or maybe you use a blood pressure monitor at home, and it reads out your heart rate for you, you will find that your resting heart rate will slow down. That is a sign that you are doing the cardiovascular exercise that is helping your health. So keep on those goals, keep working on your assignment, and I look forward to speaking to you again next week. Thank you. All right. Hopefully we have three more sessions and by then you may move up a little bit on our life scale. But thank you. We're going to keep that assignment in mind and I hope you like me having actually doing it. All right. It's time for our second lecture again. So we're going to turn it back over. All right. That was a great workout. Thank you, Laura. So now we're gonna talk about the health promoting effects of plant proteins. We have a lot of options when we're considering protein rich plant foods. There are soy foods like um, edamame, edamame beans are a whole form of soy. And then we have processed soy foods. We also have legumes, which include beans, peas, lentils, and peanuts nuts, which grow on trees, as well as seeds. And then even the whole grain quinoa is a protein rich plant food. So what would happen if we replaced some protein from animal foods with plant protein? The Nurses Health Study and Health Professionals Follow-Up Study looked at 130,000 participants and they did this calculation of substituting just 3% of energy or 3% of the daily calories in these participants that they were getting from animal protein with plant protein. And they found that that small adjustment reduced the risk of death from cardiovascular disease and from cancer. And this was true regardless of the type of animal protein in question, whether it was processed or unprocessed red meat, poultry, fish, eggs, or dairy, replacing calories from those foods with plant protein reduced the risk of premature death. So why would plant protein be better for us than animal protein? Well, there are a number of factors that probably play a role. Leucine may be one of those factors. All amino acids stimulate insulin production by the beta cells of the pancreas. Leucine, though, is an amino acid that promotes more insulin production than other amino acids. And some scientists believe that high intakes of leucine in our diet could stimulate our beta cells to chronically over-secrete insulin. So what foods can we eat to reduce our insulin consumption? Well, you can see, I'm sorry, our leucine consumption. You can see the bottom four options here on this slide are plant foods, and they contain less than 500 milligrams of leucine per 100 grams of food. The options above them are animal foods, high in protein, and they contain more than 1400 milligrams of leucine per 100 grams of food. So it turns out that the foods lowest in leucine are plant foods, which are high in carbohydrate. Iron is an essential mineral and it plays a key role in metabolism and is important for the formation of DNA. Yet research has uncovered that 
excess amounts of iron have detrimental metabolic effects. So iron can act as a pro-oxidant and can cause insulin resistance if consumed in excess amounts. Iron stored, excess iron stored in our fat cells and in our muscle cells can reduce glucose uptake into those cells. This means that glucose gets trapped in the blood. And then if we have excess iron in our liver, insulin signaling in the liver uh, does not work well. And so the liver releases more glucose. Now there are two forms of iron in our diet. There's heme iron and there is non-heme iron. Non-heme iron is found predominantly in plant foods such as fruits, vegetables, whole grains, leafy greens, nuts, and seeds. And heme iron is found predominantly in animal foods, meat, poultry, and fish. Now, heme iron, which we get from meat, is more readily absorbed than non-heme iron. So a little bit of heme iron goes a long way in adding to our iron stores. A study, um, oh, actually meta-analysis, so this is looking at three studies on humans, found that five milligrams, just five milligrams per day of heme iron in our diet could increase the risk of developing type two diabetes by 224%. So what foods could we consume to get that five milligrams? Well, one serving or three ounces of beef or chicken liver of oysters or mussels will give us three and a half milligrams of heme iron. And then other meats, which are high in heme iron or cooked beef and canned sardines, which give us 2.1 milligrams per serving. So this suggests that even small amounts of animal products can significantly increase our risk of elevated blood sugars. Advanced glycation end products are compounds which are created in our bodies and can also be found in the food we eat. They're called ages for short, and ages are formed in our bodies when a glucose molecule attaches to a protein or a fat molecule. And it's important that we keep our blood sugars down because if we have high levels of blood sugar, like above our target range, we have a lot more glucose floating around, which can then get attached to proteins or fats in our body and form ages. Now, when we get ages from food, the cooking methods that we use to prepare that food have a lot to do with the age content. The cooking that involves um, high levels of heat and dry methods of cooking, um, increased age formation, or as cooking in moist environments at lower temperatures, such as boiling, stewing, steaming, or poaching, substantially limits age production. Now it's uh, not just how we cook our food, but also what we're eating that determines the age content of our food. So the foods highest in age content are animal foods, as you see depicted there, and the foods lowest in age content are grains, legumes, breads, vegetables, and fruits. So this is yet another reason to focus on getting protein from plant sources. Legumes are a great source of plant protein, which are high in fiber, and they've been shown to reduce blood sugars after the meal they're eaten at. So a study looked at adults with type 2 diabetes. These individuals consumed 50 grams of carbohydrate after they had fasted for 12 hours. So this was like their breakfast, uh, 50 grams of carbohydrate. And they got all 50 grams either from white rice alone or from some rice combined with beans and blood sugars were measured every 30 minutes for up to three hours after this meal. You can see the blood sugars depicted in the columns. When people consumed all 50 grams of carbohydrate from white rice, their blood sugars were higher than if they consumed some of those carbohydrates from white rice and some from beans. And this was true if they ate kidney beans depicted in the red columns, black beans, 
depicted in black columns, or pinto beans depicted in the brown columns. So legumes, because they're high in fiber, help to level off our blood sugars after a meal. Now we know that legumes are great to consume if we want to lower our blood sugars after the meal we eat them at, but legumes and whole grains can even lower our blood sugars after the next meal. This is called the second meal effect. So this uh, studs, there, I looked at an um, article that basically summarize the number of studies looking at the effect of dif eating different uh, types of legumes and different whole grains. So you can see here in the top row, if a person eats lentils rather than whole wheat bread at breakfast in this study, um, after lunch, four hours later, their blood glucose would be reduced by 38%. And another study showed that if a person ate barley kernels, either whole or cracked for breakfast in place of whole wheat bread, I'm sorry, this was actually looking at dinner. So we're talking now about the dinner meal, the evening meal, eating barley kernels instead of whole wheat bread at dinner, lowered blood sugars at breakfast the next day, 10 and a half hours later, and blood sugars after breakfast were decreased by 28%. Now, the effect of uh, reduced blood sugars after the next meal was lost if the barley was milled. So if I have barley flour for dinner, I may not see the same reduction in my blood sugars at, after breakfast the next morning. So again, whole grains, eaten whole, as well as legumes are excellent tools for managing blood sugars for long periods of time. Another study was looking at the impact of legumes, and they were looking at people with type 2 diabetes who were given a three-month diet trial. The goal was to increase fiber in the diet, and these persons either started to eat one cup per day of cooked beans, peas, or lentils. They just added that to their diet for three months, or they increased their fiber by eating more whole wheat products. And at the end of three months, those who had added a cup of cooked beans, peas, or lentils to their diet daily had lost 5.7 pounds, their A1C had come down by 0.5, and their triglycerides dropped a significant amount, 21 points. Now, if they switched from eating more refined grains to eating whole wheat breads and whole wheat products. They also lost weight, 4.4 pounds, and their A1C came down by 0.3. So legumes really did reduce the A1C um, quite a bit. Some medications for diabetes will reduce the A1C by about 0.5. So I think legumes are great natural medicine for diabetes. And you can see that if a person switches from eating a lower fiber diet and starts adding a cup of legumes to their diet every day, and they switch from eating refined breads, refined pastas, to eating whole grain breads and pastas, there they can have an even uh, greater cumulative drop in their weight and in their A1Cs. So one way to plan out our meals, and today we're gonna talk about lunches, um, is to consider the plate method. You're probably familiar with this method. It's quite popular and it's easy to think about. And we can just visualize a nine inch plate and we can fill half of that with non-starchy vegetables. And then we can think about filling another um, side of the plate, a quarter here with carbohydrates. We want to increase our fiber, so we could choose whole grains or we could use whole grain pasta or maybe a potato, winter squash. And then another quarter of our plate is going to be filled with protein. And if we want plant protein, we've already discussed the options. Legumes are excellent choices, high in fiber. So here's a colorful depiction of meal planning from Dr. Linda Nelson. And when we're building our lunch, we want to add a grain for a carbohydrate. And we can choose between whole grains or whole grain pastas. 
and then we want to include vegetables, both the cooked vegetables as well as raw. And for protein, legumes are a great place to turn, and we have many choices, as you can see. This is just a reminder that if you're wondering if you're getting enough protein or if you're getting too much protein or if you're wanting to know if you're getting all the essential amino acids, you can look at your daily report on Chronometer. This is a free app. And from the home screen, which is the diary screen, you can click on the three dots at the upper right corner. That will take you to this list of options. You can click daily report. And on there, you're gonna see your grams of fiber for the day, as well as many other nutrients. And if you scroll down all the way to the bottom, you can find protein and then you can see um, they've listed all of the essential amino acids as well as some others here. So you can see what percentage you're getting um, out of the recommended percent. So in summary, we've seen there are a lot of benefits to eating plant protein. We see that they are high in content of underconsumed nutrients like fiber, antioxidants, and they're low in overconsumed nutrients like saturated fat and cholesterol. And not only do a number of sources of plant protein lower our blood sugars after the meal that we eat them at, but things like whole grains and beans can also lower our blood sugars at the next meal. Well, it's been my honor to spend this time with you today. I hope you have a wonderful time adding plant protein to your menus this week. I wish you God's blessings, and I'm looking forward to seeing you back next week when we'll talk about carbohydrates.